Welcome to our Sound for Video session. Today is the 3rd of February, 2018. It's a question and answer session. First question up is from John. He says, still confused about LUFS levels for videos submitted to YouTube and Vimeo. To ensure best audio quality after uploading, should the video file be audio be mastered to minus 24, minus 23, minus 16, or minus 14 LUFS? Some testing done and available on Vimeo shows that minus 14 LUFS will produce the best audio after processing. I would appreciate a little more discussion on LUFS level levels for the online streaming services. Um, so there is some debate, and um, I don't know that there's a technically correct answer to this, John, but let me let me tell you what my thoughts are. If you're going to be posting your video to an online service, I would target minus 16 LUFS. Um, minus 14 LUFS is what some of the music services target, and uh, for kind of modern pop style, rock, you know, hip hop, all that stuff, Minus 14 LUFS is made to be just fine. All that all that music is hyper compressed anyways. <laughs> so that's fine. Uh, minus 16 is really useful for online because if your audience is listening back on a phone with earbuds or in a really poor listening environment, in a car, in a train, in an airplane, um, minus 16 is helpful because then they don't have to, uh, they'll be able to hear <laughs> and, and basically because those don't necessarily have a lot of amplification they can do or... Um, the audio quality is not necessarily that great. Minus 23 and minus 24 LUFS are really for broadcast television. Minus 24 is the um, required loudness standard for the United States, minus 23 for Europe. So uh, for online, I would not target those necessarily. Um, so again, minus 16. If I'm going to make it very simple, target minus, nice, minus 16. Um, minus 14, from my point of view, requires more compression, so you're affecting the sound overall. Um, I don't generally find that sound to be particularly pleasant. And and honestly, I sometimes feel like minus 16 is even a little hot um, in terms of compression. So, um, but anyway, for online, minus 16 or minus 17 at the, at the least. So there's some thoughts on that. I hope that's helpful for you, John. Whoops, coming back to Paul here. Had a question. I would like you to give a general overview of your most used Isotope plugins. The reason I'm interested is that they have many packages and there may be sub package that may cover 80% or so of most used at a lower price. That's a good point here. Paul, here is the Isotope site with RX and the different options here. There's RX elements, standard and advanced. And let me just run over here to RX. I'm, I'm of course using the advanced version because I do quite a lot of audio processing. There are a ton of different plugins that I use <laughs> or different tools within RX that I use. So let me just run through them really quickly and I'll kind of narrow it down to what I think are my very top priorities as far as the, the different items available here. So of those I use, um, D, uh, actually breath control is not represented there. There it is, okay. Uh, just running down the list, breath control is a really nice one. Um, I use that because once you have normalized your audio, loudness normalized your audio to minus 16, a lot of times for dialogue audio, the breaths become very prominent in between phrases. So what the breath control does is it's essentially, it's not a gate, it's not the same as a gate, um, but it does something I think more intelligent than a gate does. So a gate, it relies on an amplitude threshold and it's not necessarily, it's really hard to tune those just right for voice. Um, they can be used, but they're but it's hard to use them for voice. In any case, this this actually looks at the frequencies that are typically associated with breaths, which is a specific set of frequencies. And it uses that in addition to amplitude to, to identify a breath and then reduce its amplitude. And it doesn't completely, unless you tell it to do this, it doesn't completely squash the breath. It doesn't totally eliminate it because that sounds very artificial. It just makes it less distracting by reducing its overall amplitude. So that's a really useful one. Uh, declick is very nice as well as mouth declick. Um, those are nice when you're working on uh, really... When you're really trying to go in and, and do a really, really nice job for a film or something of that nature, I wouldn't necessarily do this on a YouTube video unless there's a really bad mouth click. And by now, mouth clicks, I mean things like, and then just sort of the sounds that mouths make sometimes that are kind of unpleasant. So declick and mouth declick are two that I use there. Declip is one that I use if I do have a little bit of clipping in the audio. It works really well in... RX, it works, I think, better in RX than it does in Audition. Audition also has a similar declipping tool, um, but this is really kind of state-of-the-art. It essentially reconstructs the clipped um, peaks that got clipped during a recording. Now, if it gets, if you have a really 
really heavily clipped piece of audio, this is not going to make it sound pristine and perfect. But if you have just a little bit, this can often bring it back and make it so it's not distracting. So that's a useful one there. DS, um, it does have a very nice DSer as well, which is hidden somewhere around here. Let's see, there it was. Here's the DSer. Um, it works great. The DSer in Audition also works great. So it's just nice to have this as another option. Dhum is definitely one that I will use for audio that's shot on location where I'm picking up hums. And this one works really nicely. It also has this suggest feature. So if you have a piece of audio, it will go out and try and find where it thinks the hum is and uh, help you clean that up. And it has a lot of really great options that make it quite easy to clean up hum. So the hum is a nice one as well. The reverb is really nice. This is something that you don't get in things like Audition stock. You have to buy it separately. Um, this is a really hard thing to do with audio is to clean up reverb. Uh, so this one is not perfect, but it does a pretty nice job. It also has a learn feature. So you can select some audio and tell it to learn that. And it will identify what it thinks is the profile and suggest some initial settings to work with. So um, I do pull that out when I need it. I don't like to pull it out very much or you're often trading off artifacts for reverb. So just like with anything, there's always a cost, but that one works pretty well. The wind is a new one in RX Advanced. Um, and I don't know if the others have it or not. Just Advanced has D wind. Um, this is really helpful if for some reason you're out in the wind. And we're going to talk about wind a little bit later in one of the other questions. Ideally, you have some wind protection on your microphones, but if for whatever reason you got a little bit of wind in there, that's a really nice one. Spectral denoise and voice denoise, these two over here, I rely on a lot. I almost always use the voice denoise when I need to do just a little bit of denoising on a voice. Um, but if I have to get in and really kind of dig in and, and really do a special careful job, the spectral denoise is even, it has a lot more settings that you can work with and kind of fine tune it. Both of them work brilliantly, so love those a lot. Next up, we have our EQ. This is, there's, um, there's nothing particularly special about this one, except that it does have a uh, linear phase option here. The digital option means that when you apply EQ, it's not going to drastically change the amplitude of your waveforms and perhaps make them asymmetrical. Um, if you do the analog one, you can run into that. With the digital one, it's uh, very careful about not doing that. So that, and again, most of the times I'm just using the high pass filter in here just to clean up any sort of low frequency, you know, noise down here. So for example, I might just boom, you can see how it cleaned some of that up. Um, so that's why I'm, I'm using it most of the time, um, but you can use that in other applications as well. Next up, we have our EQ match right here. Um, this is worthy of a separate tutorial on its own, but if you have a recording from two different mics and they sound very different, but you want to sound you want them to sound fairly similar, you can use this to EQ one of the mics to sound more like the other one. An amazing feature, really useful in narrative film work often. All right, we're getting to those that I find absolutely critical. The loudness um, plugin or tool I find critical, and I use this all the time to loudness normalize my audio at the end when I'm done. Um, this is one of the nicer loudness tools I've worked with, so I really like that. And then finally, phase. Now this is one that only used to be in advanced, but it looks like it's in all three versions now. I only use one thing on this for dialogue audio is the adaptive phase rotation. So you'll see here, yeah, just the adaptive phase rotation. So what this does in practical terms is when you have a waveform like this, you can see it's centered around the minus infinity line or minus, you know, the, the center line. So it's there's no DC offset, which is a common, it's not a common problem. It used to be more common in the analog days, but um, so there's no DC offset. But what happens here is you can see the amplitude of the waveform is has higher, it's higher amplitude on the top than it is on the bottom. That's not a problem in terms of audio quality, but it can be a problem because it can rob you of some headroom. So you can't necessarily loudness normalize it to the extent that you want to. So with the adaptive phase rotation, if, if I run it here, you'll see it evens it up and it doesn't change the timbre of the sound. So that's really, really helpful. Now, some people will say, well, there's something wrong with your microphone or your preamplifier, your recorder or something if you're getting asymmetric waveforms. That hasn't been my experience. I think that a lot, not all, but many men's voices um, tend to have 
asymmetric waveforms. It's just a feature of some voices. Also affects some instruments, not all, but um, some of the brass instruments seem to be affected by it as well, um, or the woodwinds, excuse me, so saxophones and, and things of that nature. So in any case, I would say of these, for me, the critical ones, again, and I don't know if you're using Audition or not. In Audition, you can do your loudness stuff, so you wouldn't necessarily need that. I would say phase is one of them. This is something Audition does not have. I would say the denoise is one of them as well. While Audition does have some denoising, it is not nearly as effective as this one. This one is huge. One note, RX is not a replacement for a digital audio workstation app. It's not, in my mind, a replacement for Audition. And yes, I do a lot of my work in RX, but I still, when I'm mixing, I need Audition. I can't mix in RX. So I just want to make it clear that I'm not saying that you can use RX in lieu of a digital audio workstation like Audition. There's still a place for both of them. I know what you're trying to do here, and I understand that when budgets are tight, you have to kind of really focus in and decide where you want to spend your money. If I could only buy one RX or Audition, I would probably buy RX and I would use Audacity, as crazy as that sounds. <laughs> Uh, but you can do really very nice compression in Audacity, which is a free application if you're not familiar with it. And then I would rely on um, sorry RX to do all of the really kind of delicate um, processing that's so important. So there are some thoughts on that. So I hope that's helpful for you. Of course, there is the website that shows you which features are in which version. So hopefully with that information, you can make some decisions on what's most important for you. Let me just make a final run through and make sure there's nothing else I missed. Yeah, that's a good summary. Okay, coming back. Thank you, Paul. Next up, Kyle. I was wondering about wireless hops to the camera to Video Village. I've seen directors wearing headphones at Video Village and was wondering how that was done. Kyle, good news for you. We have two videos that will actually run through this for you. The first one was with my friend Greg Palmer. And a second one we also have over here is where we actually run through a Comtech system. So a Comtech is a wireless radio system. It's actually, they're used pretty commonly um, to do these wireless hops to either to camera or for headphone use. Um, the nice thing is you get just one transmitter that you hook up to your mixer and then you can get as many receivers as you need and just tune them all to the same channel and they all get to hear the same thing. So there's that. In the case here with Greg, what we talked about was using a Sennheiser G3 wireless system, which is normally used for lavalier microphones um, or plug-on transmitters for handheld microphones. And we talked about actually using them in the inverse to send wireless hops to the camera. So hopefully those are useful. I'll put a link for each of those down below. Next up, question from Jelani. I've been recording some Foley and sound effects using the Sound Devices 633 audio recorder and the Sennheiser MKH 8060 microphone lately. And I was wondering if you have a suggested target peak on the audio meter when recording Foley and sound effects. Um, yes, I do have some ideas there. Um, first of all, it's important to understand that on the Sound Devices 633, the meter is not a digital dB full scale meter. It is actually a dBU meter, so it's a little bit different. So zero is not clipping on a dBU meter. And generally for sounds that I specifically want to be used in cases where the picture is going to be a close up or relatively close to the object that's making the sound, in that case, I'm generally gonna target zero dBU on the 633's meter when I'm recording it. However, if you're recording an ambiance, you don't probably generally want to be at zero dBU, in my experience. I think that's when you definitely can uh, back it off. And, it, and it's, you know, you need to be able to keep the sound, whatever it is you're recording, above this noise floor, which you're definitely going to be able to do on the 633 without a problem because it's very clean. Preamps are very clean. Um, but I would definitely, you know, for those, I would let them sit down much lower and... Um, I would do some experimenting, but I would, you know, when I did some ambiances and room tones and things of that nature, I usually leave it gained for close miking dialogue and things of that nature, and then just let the ambiance fall where it does. So hopefully that's helpful for you, Jelani. If anyone else has recommendations, love to hear those in the comments below. All right, first question from Brad. When sending gain on the mix pre, are the levels on the monitor showing gain input levels or mixed post fader levels? Can you go back and forth between the two? Good question. Um, what's happening is that the left and right mix is showing the post fader levels of the entire mix, and all the isolated meters are showing the pre fader level on each of those uh, microphone inputs. So that's what you're getting on each of those. Can you go back and forth? I don't think there's a way to switch it other than when you want to see the pre fader level, look at the meter view that shows you the isolated channels. That's your pre fader level for each of those inputs. 
And then if you want to see the post fader, you have the left and right mix meters. So um, there's not a way to look at the levels on an isolated channel post fader other than the, the left and right mix. So good question, as far as I can tell. If I'm incorrect, someone please correct me in the comments in a helpful fashion. We aim for recording at minus 18 dB to minus 12 dB to stay under a peaking level and over ambient sound levels. But if recording in an environment with heavier ambient noise, examples driving inside a car in a crowd outside on windy day, etc., how do we handle the gain? Gain vocals higher for more separation? You don't actually get higher separation when you gain higher. Everything comes up. The, the dialogue comes up and the noise floor comes up. So you don't gain anything by doing that. So no, I would typically gain the same way. Unless there's ambient noise, it's so loud that it's it's eclipsing the dialogue, in which case you have another problem you have to solve. And you have to solve that problem by actually using more directional microphones. So that's really the way to get separation. So I wouldn't gain differently. I would just use a more isolating microphone. So a longer shotgun micro microphone, perhaps, um, or something with a tighter pickup pattern. And then the final question, my main reason for sending audio from a recorder to a camera would be just to have a better quality and levels of sound for auto syncing in post. In this case, rather than matching levels of minus 20 and minus 20, should I boost the in-camera levels just a little more for a louder signal? Uh, no, I would not recommend that. The reason for matching minus 20 to minus 20 on the recorder and the camera is that that way it will not clip in your camera. And that's really important. So if you have a lot of clipping, then it's gonna have your, you know, whatever you're using for syncing in post, is gonna have a harder time doing that syncing because you have all that distortion on the camera audio. So no, I would not boost the levels. You should get good sync as long as you set the, you know, do the, this, the level matching to minus 20 using the tone. So hope that helps, Brad. Thanks for the good questions. Next up from John. So I'm about to start a passion project documentary and had a few quick questions about some very basic things. If you do not want to answer for the Q&A, that's fine. Of course I want to answer for the Q&A, John. <laughs> I have a GH5 with a Panasonic XLR unit and an A6300 with the Pix E5 and Pix LR. So that's the external um, recorder, video recorder, plus the uh, two input XLR microphone uh, recorder that goes along with the Pix E. You have a digital Bolex camera with an NTG4, two AVX LAVs, and MKE2 mics, an NTG3 mic on a boom that's recording to an H6. So you have a really nice kit. That should do a good job. My doc is about the midnight mission program called Music with a Mission, where the homeless learn how to play music from some of the world's greatest artists. So from the standpoint of sound, I have the performances to deal with, but I will also follow the stories of some of the homeless as they use music to lift themselves up and give them a respite from life on the streets. So I will not have a lot of time to get it right, as these types of interviews may be very spontaneous. My question has to do with syncing them all up to make it easier in post for me to edit. Can I jam sync everything with a with a tentacle, or do I need the Mix Pre Six um, or the Mix Pre Ten? Okay, so John, you have two main. I, I would say you have two, maybe three main options. Number one, if you're trying to, to automate it as much in post, I would say then you have two options. So of course you can slate or clap or whatever. Good old fashioned manual. Um, syncing based on a, a visual and sound reference point. That's what clapping or using a slate does. So um, I'm assuming that you don't want to do that in light of the circumstances here. So the other option, is, the other two options are, number one, use a syncing application like Pluralize. And what that means is you have to record good scratch audio on the cameras, which it looks like you have all the gear to do, and um, good audio on the audio recorder, in this case, the Zoom H6, and then this will sync them up in post. As long as you get that good reference audio, this works very, very nicely. So that's one option. There's also another new app called Syncala, I think is how you say it, um, that does the same thing. And um, they're claiming that they're gonna make something better than Pluralize. So we'll see how it goes. It looks interesting. We're gonna take a look at this here in the near future. Um, of course, so that's one option, using the post sync method where you automate the sync using an application that's made for that. The other option is to use time code and tentacle sync is a good way to do that. Um, what this means is that you, you do not need to buy a Mix Pre 6 or a Mix Pre 10, although there are other advantages to buying those, but you can just use the tentacle sync studio. If you do not have, if you don't go with a Mix Pre 10, for example, and you're using the Zoom H6, your Zoom H6 does not have two things. Number one, it does not have a time code generator built into it. So you have to make sure you buy an extra time code generator, a new tentacle sync, for the recorder in addition to all the cameras. And then 
Um, if you do have one like the MixPre 10T that does have a time code generator built in, it will work with the tentacle syncs and you don't need an extra one for the audio recorder. You just need a tentacle sync for each of the cameras. So there are the thoughts there. If you, I think you really probably want to look more into how this process works if you do decide to go with uh, time code. Um, here, I'll put a link to this. Here we have an overview using the Tentacle Sync E time code generators. Um, I have a few of the others over there as well. Um, so you'll want to watch kind of the workflow here, and you'll want to do a lot of testing before you get out on the streets and start interviewing these people so that you have that process working. What would I do? Well, in the projects, um, I actually did work on a project uh, a little over a year ago. We went and interviewed some homeless people. I was the sound guy, um, the guy that was the director and the DP, did not want to use tentacle sync or any other sort of time code. So he used Pluralize to sync everything up and it worked fine. He was able to, he had, he did have a camera top shotgun microphone. We were working him pretty close to the talent. So he was able to get good enough sync audio so that syncing in post was not a problem. So that's what we did in that particular case. Um, tentacle sync can work really well too. There's a little bit more setup time, um, but you, and you know, you can make mistakes either way. So I would say either one, whichever one you're more comfortable with is a fine approach. All right, next question. Uh, I'm still confused of what dB level should I set it to? Now, I'm a little unclear on this as to whether you're talking about recording and where you should be aiming for your peaks to be hitting, or are you talking about post and where the overall loudness should be set? So here you asked minus 12 to minus 18. Well, if it, during recording, I'm usually going to target that to be between minus 18 and minus 12, somewhere in there peaking between minus 18 and minus 12. With a Zoom H6, um, I, I would probably aim a little closer to minus 12, but you leave yourself enough headroom because you do not have quality limiters in an H6, just the reality of the situation. So you got to leave yourself some headroom in case things get really loud and out on the street, things can get really loud <laughs> really quickly. So um, I hope that helps there. We're going to, uh, we, we talked a little bit about post uh, loudness, LUFS. I don't think you're, you're asking about that here, but, um, oh, actually maybe you are. I want the final product to possibly play at festivals, but if I am lucky, it will probably just end up online. Now, post is a completely different thing. So that's where we were talking about LUFS earlier. For a festival, I would probably, you know, a festival, typically they're going to have a decent audio playback system at a festival. So um, you probably don't have to push, you definitely don't have to push as hard as minus 14 LUFS. Um, but you also, even minus 16 is probably not necessary. Because again, you're, you're going to have to do some compression in most cases to get to minus 16 LUFS. Also, if I am trying to capture the performances out of the board, does that mean I would need to run it into a line instead of a mic in? Yes, that is true. You will have to run it. The board will typically feed a line level signal, so you will need to change the inputs on your recorder to line level. I, I don't have an H6, so I don't have a way to check this here, but I have heard some people complain that they've had trouble recording line level signals into the H series. I know for certain the H4, the original H4 and the H4N had problems with this from a soundboard. So you'll want to do some tests beforehand. I believe on the H6 that line input has to be on a quarter inch TRS input. So you're going to need to figure out what the board has in terms of output, whether it's XLR or quarter inch TRS. And then on the other end of the cable, it's going into the H6, which is, a, I assume, what you're going to be recording to. Um, it needs to be quarter inch TRS. So You'll want to make sure you have the right cables for the job there. And you'll definitely want to do some experimenting beforehand so that you don't miss one of the presumably amazing performances that you're probably going to capture here. So John, sounds like a really exciting project. I wish you all the best on that and hope those were helpful for you. Next up, we have Jeff. Question about speakers. I use studio headphone monitors for critical work, but often I like to listen via studio monitor speakers as well. Okay. I'm having trouble working out a compromise for placement of the speakers as I use a three video monitor set, two for DaVinci Resolve plus a grading monitor screen. This leaves me with the choice of the speakers being very wide apart or set above the screens. Any advice and go easy. <laughs> You've already cost me to buy a Mix Pre 6 and an AT4053B mic. Jeff, I, I, I guess I apologize on behalf of anyone who may not have wanted you to spend that money, but I'm also really glad you got those because I think you have a really good kit there. 
Um, yes, I, I would probably go up above and aim the monitors down at you. What you want is the tweeters aimed at your ears. You want them equidistant from your ears and each other. So you want to create an equilateral lateral triangle. And then you probably also want to, if possible, put some sort of uh, absorbing material, preferably some sort of broadband um, trap to at the first reflection point, so where the audio will go directly. Um, that's the ideal situation. So yeah, you could you could go up. I don't have any specific stands to recommend to you in terms of getting up that high and aiming aiming them down. You may have to go custom. Um, I actually built my own, so I don't have any recommendations specifically on that. So um, so I'm not going to break your bank <laughs> today with any sort of recommendation. But I hope that helps. Going the problem with going farther apart is then you don't have that equilateral triangle um, going on, and things get very very directional. Um, and that's generally not how most people are listening. So um, I would I would stick with the equilateral triangle and go above the monitors and aim them down. Hope that helps there, Jeff. Good luck. Next question from Vita. Pretty basic question, probably answered a number of times before. I shot a wedding recently. I used H1 connected to Rode Smart Law for speeches. The father's bride audio is clipped. To mention first, though, it was the wedding from your nightmares. The venue's mic kept cutting in and out constantly. The venue's mic, and this is my question, had its volume very high, so even the gain turned way down on the H1 audio still sounds clipped. It is truly ugly. What would cause it? Uh, would that cause it? The venue's mic being turned up too high. When the mic cut out and all you heard was the father's natural voice, it was really good. Okay. So, yes, absolutely. Um, the problem with the Zoom H1 is w while it's a really neat low budget kind of uh, way to, to record something with a lavalier mic or just by itself. The problem with it is, one of the problems with it is that it does not, doesn't have any sort of analog pad for really loud sound sources. So um, when you when you take it below a certain level, and I don't remember exactly what the setting is on the H1, I think it was 18 or something like that, but anything below that level, it's doing what is called digital attenuation. So what that means in practical terms is if you've already clipped, going lower than that is not going to fix the clipping. It's still going to be clipped. It's just going to be, uh, it's going to clip and then it's going to pull it down uh, in amplitude from there. So no, that won't fix it. And yes, that is a known limitation of the Zoom H1. I wouldn't say it's a bug. I think they intentionally did it that way. It's a low cost recorder. So, um, you know, it's not surprising that they did something like that. The new, there's a new H1N that has just been announced and I have one on order here to take a look at that. I don't know if that one will do that as well. We'll see. Um, but yeah, that's not unusual. The, the trick that you have there is two things. Number one, you're capturing the sound, I assume, directly from the person speaking, plus you have the loudspeaker system that's also arriving to the recorder later and so you're getting phasing, plus you're getting this clipping because they turned it on too high. I'd be, I'd be very concerned about everyone's eardrums uh, and the and you know the nerves in your ears. Um, it sounds like they had that on ridiculously high. So yeah, I'm, I, I apologize. There's not an easy answer for solving that problem. But ideally, what you could do in the future is that if you're going to shoot a lot of weddings, um, ideally, you can record directly from the board if there's going to be a board. Um, that way, you're going to avoid some of the phasing issues, first of all. And you're also probably going to avoid some of the clipping issues as well, because then you'd be recording the signal before it even gets to the loudspeakers. So something to consider. Now, that being said, you can still clip even just getting the signal out of a board. I've had that happen to me before. Uh, back in my early days when I was recording a little bit more frequently with the H1, um, I recorded a concert and it turned out to all be clipped because the signal coming out of the board was just so darn hot. Um, in that case, what I should have been using was an attenuation cable of some sort. Um, of course, I didn't have one at the time. So if you are going to record weddings frequently, I would probably look at other solutions. That's probably not your best bet um, on the H1. So... Thanks for the question, Vida. I hope, hope that was helpful. Probably didn't feel very helpful, but <laughs> there are some thoughts. Next up from Kevin. This may be way off base, but I've been trying to find a good, good info about indemnity and liability insurance for location sound freelancers. That's a fantastic question. And Kevin, um, he, we actually corresponded via email a little bit. I am in the same boat. I have talked to three insurance brokers so far. I have still not found a policy that provides the coverage I need at a reasonable price. It's just ridiculously expensive what I've found so far. 
So um, th the good news in, for me, fortunately, it's not quite as critical, but this is a good question. And, I, and I'd like to invite anyone else who's watching who does have experience with that or any ideas to um, to leave some references down below if you, if you have found some insurance that works for those purposes. Fortunately for me, most of my work is being done by my employer and they carry the insurance, so I don't have to. Um, I have worked for some production companies where it was a large enough production company that they carried the insurance and hired me on as a temporary employee, so I was covered under that insurance. Um, but in cases where that's not how they're doing things, where you're truly a freelancer, it's up to you to carry that insurance. And so fortunately, I, I haven't done a lot of those jobs. I've done some, um, and I am still looking for a policy that'll work. The problem is, is I don't do them all the time. So financially, it's not quite, it's, it's risky um, to not carry it, um, but it's also not quite to the point uh, where it's a kind of a no-brainer for the for the premium. <laughs> so good question, and I invite others to, to kind of chime in on that. Thanks. Next up, Raleigh. I'm a Final Cut Pro user, as are you, I believe. My question, how do you round trip between Final Cut Pro 10 and Adobe Audition? Do you use something like X to CC, or do you have another system? A brief explanation of your process would be a great help to me and others like me, I'm sure. Thanks. Yes, uh, really, that's exactly what I do. I uh, use Final Cut Pro 10. I export an XML, the, the latest version of the XML. I then run that through X to CC, which creates a new XML file, and then I import that into Adobe Audition. That at a high level is exactly what I do. It is not a perfect process. Um, the trick with Final Cut Pro 10, I love, but it also drives me crazy in terms of audio. I love editing in it. Um, the, the magnetic timeline works so well for video. It is an absolute nightmare for audio though, <laughs> um, in my opinion. And, and the reason I say that is for mixing, it makes things a little bit more difficult. So for example, um, how do you, how do you, you can't create a bus, you can't, um, you know, so where do you put a loudness meter if you're trying to get the overall program loudness and things of that nature? That's why I go to Adobe Audition. Now, once you do go to Adobe Audition with that method I just described there, um, there, and actually I guess I should pull up the X2CC website so you can see, yeah, this is it right here. I'll put a link for this down below. Um, so it's an application that does cost money, as I recall, it's $50. Yeah, it looks like it's $50. Yeah, that's a, pri that's a steep price tag for those of us using um, Final Cut Pro 10. But on the bright side, Final Cut Pro 10, once you pay the $300 for that app, I bought it three years ago, maybe three and a half years ago, and haven't spent another dime to keep it updated, which is very different from Adobe. So <laughs> spending 50 bucks on this was, for me, kind of a no-brainer because, you know, I have not had to pay for Final Cut Pro 10 for years, which is nice. Um, unfortunately, I do have to pay for Adobe Audition. Um, that's a different, I'm getting off on a tangent. I apologize. In any case, once you bring it into Adobe Audition, it's not perfect. You're going to have to do some cleanup and reorganize tracks. And um, sometimes it does funky things where it will bring in um, two of the same thing because it, it it's being treated as a dual mono in Final Cut. So it brings in two of the same thing. It kind of messes up the mix. But once you get it over into Audition and you get it cleaned up, remove the stuff you don't need, rename everything to what you do need. Um, it works pretty nicely. It does carry over the names of the tracks, I believe, as I recall, I believe it does. Um, so if you do have a, a, you know, an edit in Final Cut where you do have the track names on there, it will bring those over. And uh, that's that's how I work. Then when, when I, what I do there to get it back is I do a mix down and just bring the mix back, mute everything in Final Cut Pro 10 and instead use the mix. So that's the overall workflow. We'll probably cover that in more detail in the future. I've added it to my list of ideas for future sessions. So thanks for that question. Next up from Duane, two questions. I have a Mix Pre 3 and a Heil PR40 microphone and a Sennheiser wireless microphone. And I would like to interview one person and record directly to my computer. How will I configure the Mix Pre to accomplish the objective? Well, um, the Mix Pre, um, I, I don't know if you're on a Mac or a PC, so that makes a difference. If you are on a PC, let's come back. Here, yeah, there. If you're on a PC, you will want to download the MixPre ASIO driver, which is available over on the Sound Devices website. I'll put a link for that down below. They run you through how to get it set up, so I would follow those instructions. If, on the other hand, you are on a Mac, um, what we do is we just do a search for MIDI, and we're going to we're going to open this audio MIDI application. It's part of the control panel, but it doesn't show in the regular control panel, strangely. 
Um, but what you do here is you come in here. I've got a MixPre 10T. The same thing will show up here with a MixPre 3 or whichever one you're using. Uh, you're using the 3. Yep. Um, the first thing you want to do is um, on the inputs, you'll want to choose the number of inputs you're going to be using. So you can either choose, in this case, 2, 4, 6, 8. On the 3, I think you'll get... Um, I'm not sure how it'll show up exactly, but what you want to do is choose the format. So, for example, I'm generally going to be using 32-bit, 48 kilohertz for however many channels. In this case, I've got 8 XLR inputs, so that's what I'm using. I could change that to 10 because I also have the 3.5 millimeter input. So once you have that input set up there, then it becomes a question of which digital audio workstation app you're using to do the recording. That's more than I can cover here because it depends on the digital audio workstation you're doing, but um, then you have to essentially arm the tracks that you want to record and then start recording. And by arming, what I mean is choosing which of the mix pre inputs are gonna go and be recorded on which tracks. So that differs from digital audio workstation to digital audio workstation. We do cover some of that in the mix pre course if you're interested, just the basics. We don't go into too much depth there because again, it's not it's not a course about the digital audio workstation so much, but um, hopefully that, that's enough to get you a start. And then there are lots of other uh, tutorials out there for each of the di digital audio workstations. So whichever one you're using, you could follow that and see. Second, what is the best method to record audio directly to my iPhone using the MixPre 3 as an audio interface? Do you have any recommendations? I have an iPhone 10. Well, first of all, you're going to need a way to adapt the um, the input or the output from the MixPre to the input on the phone, which is a lightning input. And so you'll want the Apple Lightning to USB camera adapter, which we'll put this link down below for you. I have not done this before, so this is not something I'm, a, I'm an expert on. But my understanding is that when you do that, it is only class compliant, which means that you're going to get two channels. And I think it's going to be a mix. I don't think you're going to be able to get isolated channels on that. So uh, someone correct me if I'm wrong on that. But I believe it's just a mix. Um, if not, that's a that's awesome. <laughs> that's a bonus. And then, of course, you're going to need a recording app. I've used Roadrec to record stereo recordings before on iPhone. It works nicely. It's about a $5 app. It's made by Rode. Um, that's a good one. A free one that works pretty decently is the Sure Motive, the Sure Plus Motive app, which you can also find in the App Store. That one is free. It's actually designed specifically for the Sure Motive line of apps that use they have lightning connectors, and you can change the um, you know the pickup pattern a little or the polar pattern a little bit and, and kind of fine tune the mics. But you can also use it for any mic that can be recorded onto an iPhone, so or any in this case audio interface. So. Hope that helps, Dwayne. Thanks for the question on that one. Next up, two questions in regards to outdoor recording and shock mounts and blimps and wind covers. So first from Scott, what are some techniques to get the most usable outdoor audio and combat wind, birds, and other distractions? And then Stephen, I apologize if you've ever covered this topic before, but I'd like to hear about shock mounts and the blimps you use, what you like, and why. I'm most interested in the ones used when you're handling a boom pull. Okay. We have a us a video over here on YouTube. I can link you to that. This one actually was with the, um, the Rycote. I think they call this particular one the Rycote uh, Modular Wind Cover Kit. We'll open that up here. Um, so it's this more kind of traditional looking blimp, and this one works beautifully. It also comes with the, um, the furry cover here, the windsock, or you know, whatever you call it. This is for the kind of the traditional length of um, shotgun microphones, so kind of the small shotgun microphones, not the tiny ones, but the the sh what we typically call short shotgun microphones, and that's going to be things like the MKH416, um, the NTG4, um, lots, lots of the kind of the traditional short shotguns out there, Sheps, Seamit, things of that nature. So that's one option out there. This one worked quite well for me. What you can do is it, if the wind is just slight, you don't have to put the wind jammer or the wind sock on it. And then if it's a stiffer wind, then you'll want to put that on as well to get to extra protection. Um, what I use actually is another product by Rycote called the Cyclone. And this is the second generation Cyclone here. The first ones were black, the second gen are gray. Um, I think that the reason they changed the color was just because a lot of Location sound mixers wanted something that was more neutral colored. Um, the advantage this one has is a couple fold. Um, number one, it has a uh, kind of a newer tech material on the outside that does a better job of attenuating wind. 
um, and preventing the wind from making any sort of noise on the microphone uh, without using a wind cover. But you can also use a wind cover if you're in, you know, 60 or 70 mile an hour winds for whatever reason. Um, I generally don't shoot in winds like that. Um, but if you have to, that's an option. Another nice thing about it, too, is that the way it's set up, you have this... Uh, Oh, whoops, I'm going to come in from the other side here. You have this sort of magnetic system, and today the magnets are pretty sticky. Um, that makes it a little easier to get in and change out the microphone. On the, the other one that I have uh, in the link up there on the screen, um, it takes a little bit more time. You have to screw off one of the ends, slide it out to get to the microphone. And I was doing this practically one-handed and trying to stay out of the way of the mic, but it's actually quite a bit easier to get into this one. Um, they've also redesigned the suspension mount for this one, and it works really, really well. I love this this mount. It works just beautifully. So um, that's good as well. Uh, I have never needed to use the, the wind jammer or sock on top of this. In fact, I don't own one for this. But um, even recording outdoors with, you know, 25 mile an hour winds, this is fine without it. Um, so this does a really nice job. The only downside is that when you do put a microphone in something like this, you do cut off some of the high frequency pickup of the mic. So it's this is absorbing some of those high frequencies. And um, so that's just just something to know. It's not I'm not saying that's a down a, you know a downside, just a reality of the situation to to disperse that air so it doesn't run across the microphone capsule and make that distortion sound. It's got to do some things to um, absorb that air, <laughs> you know, or, or diffuse the air. Excuse me. And so, it uh, it can take it, it can take away a little bit of your high frequency response. Now there are different ways of dealing with that. In post, of course, you can try and EQ that, add a little bit of that back. Some microphones uh, actually have a high frequency um, boost uh, for that purpose. So, for example, the NTG4 from Rode does and some other higher-end microphones do as well. Um, so that, those are the first thoughts. Number two, when I use something like this, what I have found is that sometimes it does such an amazing job of eliminating all of that wind that the recording almost seems unreal, like otherworldly, because you see the wind, if it's fairly, you know, a fairly brisk wind, but you're not hearing any of it. <laughs> so... It can be a little disorienting for people. So in those cases, I would recommend also trying to record some ambiance um, just so you can mix that back in and post a little bit to taste. That's where you have full control. You don't have to put too much of it in, but perhaps just enough to kind of make it a coherent experience for your viewers. So that's a thought as well. In terms of birds and other distractions, the, the technique for doing that is using a more directional microphone. So using a shotgun microphone, getting in as close to the talent as possible. Um, for the shot, that's going to make the biggest difference in terms of birds. Um, likewise, I actually like to have a little bit of that. I don't like to completely eliminate it, um, but I don't like it to be screaming and making such a, a racket that it is pulling people out of the story. On the other hand, if you completely eliminate that, it also doesn't feel very realistic. So those are some thoughts there, Scott, on your particular question. So um, those are the particular that's the blimp that I use, the blimp cover, the Rycote Cyclone. I have used this one as well and been very happy with it as well. Um, it can't handle as high volume or high velocity winds before you have to add the windsock as a cyclone, but it's also a good way to work. Um, the downside, of course, is the cyclone is uh, actually both of them are $600 in the end. Um, so you're going to spend one way or the other. Um, the Road Blimp is actually quite a good one as well. I'll put a link for that one. In fact, let's just open that right now. I've used that one as well. That one works quite nicely, just like the um, the Rycoat, um that I showed you just a second ago. Not the Cyclone, but the other one. And here's the one we're talking about here, the Road Blimp. So this one's about half the price. It's about $300. It's a little bit heavier, um, but overall it seems to work quite nicely. And in fact, I guess in maybe it's ironic, I'm not sure, but the newer version of this also uses the Rycoat suspension system, so it has a very good shock mount as well. So um, if you're trying to keep things a little bit more affordable, the Rode Blimp is recommended as well. Thanks for those questions, Scott and Steven. And then finally, this is not a sound-related item, but uh, Steven and I talked about this a little bit. He had a question. It's not really a question per se, but I was thinking about you the other day at work. Nothing weird, I promise. Good. 
And I was thinking about how you're such a likable personality on video. I just started doing a series of vlogs on my YouTube channel and I'm a jittery, stuttering, nervous wreck. For now, I'm just trying to fake it. Like as if I have confidence, obviously it's up to you to set your priorities regarding what, what kind of content you create. I just thought I'd mention it in case you hadn't already thought of it or perhaps other people have su already suggested it and you just needed to hear it one more time. Maybe it's hidden among the plethora of videos you've already published and I missed it. At any rate, as always, love your work. Appreciate all the support you've given me and I'm glad Google helped me find you. Cheers, mate. Okay, Stephen, thanks. That's a nice compliment. I appreciate that. The reality is, is a lot of my work ends up on the cutting room floor. So a lot of it gets cut out. As you can see there, I just, I, uh, these I don't edit as much, <laughs> but I trip all over my words all the time. I'm a stuttery, jittery, jittery mess as well. Um, I cut the obvious things. I don't want to waste people's time, even with the sound for video sessions, but the sound for video sessions aren't as produced. They're not, you know, they're supposed to have that kind of fit and finish, but so there is that. I think another another part of it is spending a lot of time in front of a camera. So as you have, as you spend more time, um, you really kind of need to develop a means whereby you can kind of get yourself into the right mindset. If that's meditation or whatever it is beforehand, that actually really helps. Um, I often have to kind of sit down and take a few deep breaths just to kind of get ready for it. Sometimes I find that I rush, and I especially get that from people who where English is not their native language. They say, can you please slow down? And it's a balance because other people are very impatient and they don't like long videos. They just want to learn what I have to teach them and get out. Uh, and I understand that. And then on the other side, you have people that where English is not their first language. And so when I speak very quickly, for them, it's hard to follow and they have to run through it several times to understand what I'm saying. So um, I wish I had some secrets. I think it's experience. I think it's finding a way to kind of calm your mind right before you shoot. And third, I'm doing a lot of editing too, cutting things out. So I'll hide a lot of cuts behind B-roll. Um, I hope this is not going to make any of you think less of me, <laughs> but the reality is I'm not like the news anchors that can just get in front of a camera and speak perfectly smoothly and say exactly what needs to be said and, and avoid all of the words that should not be said. Um, that unfortunately is not where I'm at yet, but hopefully that helps you and gives you a little bit more confidence that I'm not amazing on that front either. So thanks. That was a lot of questions, a lot of really good questions. I appreciate all of those. I appreciate everything that you guys are doing in terms of getting out there and learning how to make better audio. I can tell by the questions that you're really trying and you're doing some really interesting projects. I encourage you to keep that up. Get out there and make some great sound. We'll talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.